Mountains in Northern Ireland. We begin with a lot of hot air. myself I didn't like bagpipes that scared me. To be in a pipe band, certainly to be a pipe major of a pipe band, you know you could say you have to be half mad. So many nights with band practice, so many Saturdays in the summer when I'm off for competition and my wife's a pipe band widow. My wife would probably say it's a sickness, but I think it's an addiction, a, a, an addiction. It's the sound of the pipes that catches you, it gets in under your skin and you can't get rid of it. There's nothing worse than a bad pipe on, and there's nothing better than a good pipe on. thousand people involved in piping, drumming, or at the commercial end of pipe bands. It's a tremendous community, a tremendous family. Almost every corner in the road has a pipe band. On the hill just above where I'm living, I can see in a circle right round probably the homesteads of about 15 pipe bands in eye view of where I'm standing. If you start out above the Jamara Mountains, you have Lee Pokes and then you have Grantia. You come to the other side of the mountain and then you have Kloss Kilt, Ben Rao, Carson Memorial, towards Castle Wallen, the Frank Rainey, and then you have Ansborough. Newcastle is the Crimson Ara. On round, this is where Monigore is. Then we have got Drumloch. Over in Uri, we have the Thomas Davis and Altna Bay. Out over the Knock Hill, you have Banbridge. And that's the circle completed almost right round with pipe bands. There's other pipe bands up behind the Mourne Mountains, probably five or six, but I would call them farther away than the eye can see. As regards um, little country pipe bands, we probably in Northern Ireland would have about 100 pipe bands. Probably more than half would be affiliated to the competition side of things. The Royal Scottish Pipe Band Association governs world competitions. The pipe band tradition in Northern Ireland is particularly strong. We have the best pipe bands in the world in the very top grades in Northern Ireland. I don't think you could get a greater thrill than hearing a good pipe band. And you'll not run away from one. You know, you'll stay, you'll stick it, you'll say, I want to hear this. <laughs> the image of pipe bands as one tradition in Northern Ireland would be very incorrect. Pipe bands from both traditions in Northern Ireland compete. We travel together, we go to Scotland together. There is a tremendous camaraderie. We all share the same passion. We want the same dexterity of hand and finger. We want to hit that same sound, those great notes. Traditionally, the Highland Pipes were played in Scotland. Back in the 1600s, they played as soul pipers, and they entertained the soul pipers they would have played basically peabok, the classical bagpipe music. And bands weren't thought of at this stage.
In the Battle of Culloden, Cumberland's army was attacking Bonnie Prince Charlie's army and he overrun Bonnie Prince Charlie, but the pipes were played a lot at Culloden. And then, after the battle, what developed was the Highland Clearances, where they were being pursued, Bonnie Prince Charlie's soldiers, throughout Scotland. If Cumberland's army met a McGregor or a McPherson, they were immediately, their heads came off or they were shot. And the result was these people got very, very, very cute. When they were caught or captured, they learned not to give their Highland names like McGregor, McPherson or McIntosh. They knew colours. And they called themselves, I'm Mr Brown, I'm Mr White, I'm Mr Black. And they went what was called Scot Free. They went to various countries throughout the world. They brought the bagpipes with them. That was the beauty of it. And they brought them to Ireland. People like that came to Ulster. And now we've got these names, and we've got the Mac names in Northern Ireland as well. McGregor's, McPherson's, McLooney's, McIntosh's, all these are related to piping down through the years. Highland pipes, the music would have been very much developed through the army bands of the early 20th century. In the mid-1940s, there was a great resurgence of pipe bands in the countryside. And in many ways, all the rural areas throughout Northern Ireland would have had at least one pipe band. I'm quite proud to be in a pipe band and to have learned to play the pipes and to have had two, I'm not going to name how many years, but a good number of years playing pipe, pipes successfully. Most pipe bands are family orientated. When you have brothers and sisters and their friends and their brothers and sisters, then you have a community that's going to stay there. It's passing on the tradition of bagpipes and drumming on to the next generation to allow them to carry it forward to the next generation. The drum section of any pipe band is crucial. It is the rhythm that the music flows on. It's a bit like the rails that a train runs on. If you've got a good, smooth, solid rhythm, then the melody plays well on it. It's the same with the train. If the lines are smooth, you have a smooth journey. If they're rough, you have a rough journey. Money Gore Pipe Band started just after the war in 1946. Some of the founder members of the band are still here. I, I was an understanding that the flute band was... Uh, Joe Cantley, who lives just down the road, he's 93 years of age and he still plays his pipes every day. His pipes are a bit different than ours. As his pipes is the Brian Brew pipes. They've got keys on them that allows them to play almost any tune that has ever been written. Oh, I, the first set of pipes I bought was in 1926. Yes. I bought them in Matches in Belfast. There was no pipes in the country at all at the time. Yes. There wasn't any, there wasn't any pipe bands here at all. Aye. Jamar was the first pipe band that I heard there. In this area? Yes. And now in this area we have 15 pipe bands, or yes. maybe 16. It's a bug that bites you and you can never get over it. It's something that when it gets in your blood, uh, you never want to let go of it. It's just as simple as that. It's something you don't want to let go of. My theory on it is that playing pipes keeps you fit and young, because he's still very young at heart. The bagpipes are a very temperamental instrument. 
because they're not just like a piano or say a guitar because you can't, you can't just pick them up and then that's them tuned already. You have to be playing them for a certain amount of time before they would actually sound right. And you have to constantly be tuning the drones to get them sound and then tune with your chanter. Well, most pipe bands play the Scottish Highland bagpipe. The elements of the Highland bagpipe are first and foremost the bag, um, which can be made out of either leather or sheepskin or synthetic material. The air is filled into the bag by a blowpipe. It's very important to keep the bag moist. In the old days, people had their own tried and tested methods of keeping their bag airtight. And there used to be people that would put treacle into their bags. There are three drones, two tenor drones and a bass drone, and they produce a sustained sound. You have the canter, which produces the melody. The sound of the drones, uh, coupled with the harmonics produced between the chanter and the drones, give the Highland Bagpipe its characteristic sound. Uh, they're like an octopus. <laughs> they're terrible. But I can say this, that if they weren't like that, I don't think we would play them for ten minutes. In days gone by, it was simply down to the ear of the sound man. He tuned the pipes, he tuned the drones, he listened and he tuned them. He listened to the chanters. He had to make sure the same pitch of the chanter was the same pitch of his drones. Nowadays, we have electronic tuning devices now that most bands use, but still and with all, those great, great sound men, they would tune the pipes with the electronic tuner, but they would also then, possibly a last little turn, their ear to make sure that they have got it right. You've got to treat the bagpipe very carefully. If you treat the bagpipe well, it'll do a good job for you. If you don't, it'll make your life a misery. Damp, heat, cold, all these things have an effect on it. The reed is the most important part of the pipes. It is the reeds in the pipes that make the sound that That's we hear. Is it hard for you, or is it too yeah. easy? Or you must have good reeds hard. to have a good sound. That first read of yours was a bit too stiff for you, do you? Yeah. Yep, I got them fine for you. Okay. Chanter reeds are made from bamboo cane. If the cane comes from the sunny side of the bamboo, it's a different type of cane to what comes from the shaded side. A dry reed will have a hard, dry sound. A damp reed will have a brighter sound. It's usually the blower that causes the dump or the dry. Everybody who plays the bagpipes has a different pressure of blowing. They blow a different level of moisture. And all of those things have to be taken into consideration when I'm choosing the reeds for each player. So in effect, I have to know each player within the band and exactly how they blow their instrument and how they get their own sound from the instrument so that I know that the reeds will suit them. Usually when you get a reed at the beginning, it's very, very hard to blow. Everybody complains about getting a reed that uh, their eyes are popping out of their head when they start to blow it. That's not really the case. <laughs> but um, the reeds are hard, and then once you've gone through a period of blowing them in, they basically break the back of the reed and it becomes easier to play, more comfortable for the player. Bagpipes are a tremendously difficult instrument to master. You have to coordinate blowing, you have to coordinate finger work, you've got to coordinate drones, you have to make sure that, that the sound is balanced, and then that's just you. 
maybe have uh, 13 or 14 fellow pipers getting the sound to the same pitch, the same tone, that is a huge challenge and that is what competition pipe band work is all about. Every pipe band has its own sound uniquely. There's no, no two pipe bands have exactly the same sound. Sound is a taste that different pipe natures have. Some like the sound slightly sharper, others like the sound not so sharp. It's a matter of taste. Different guys down the years have different sounds. If you're a band man, you talk about a Frank Andrews sound, or you have a Tommy Robinson sound, a Richard Park sound. I think at the top level, all of the top bands have their own characteristic sound. And I think um, people at the highest level would be able to tell the difference between those bands if they were to close their eyes and listen to the top, say, four or five bands in the world. They would be able to tell who those bands were. The sound that I produce is really striving to have the whole band sounding like one. The pipe core has to sound like one with all the intervals correct, perfectly in tune, with the drum core blending perfectly in all our melodies. The whole musical unit sounding like one complete instrument as opposed to a pipe section and a drum section with no coordination there. A good band sound is whereby, what, 20 feet above the band, that's where it all happens, that's where you hear it. You don't hear the individual instruments. There's occasions like that, they're very few and far between, but when you have that experience, it is unbelievable. The big sound is uh, often talked about, but uh, rarely heard. In my lifetime, I think I've had it twice. The hair on the back of your neck actually feels like it's prickling out and you feel goose pimples on your arms and you just feel like you're actually floating up off the ground. It's not that often that you achieve what you think is the perfect sound. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's worth waiting for. The tradition of pipe banding in the north is more though than just competition work. There are lots of bands that uh, would take part in, uh, particularly the like of Scarva on the 13th of July. The pipe bands love to go to Scarva. Historically, pipe bands were paid by black preceptories to go to Scarva, but now they're so keen they would bend over backwards to get parading up that domain in Scarva. In Scarva you would have bands that would be performing bands, competition bands. You'd also have bands that are just, if you like, out for a couple of times a year. Those bands are inspired nonetheless by the bigger bands, the better bands. So it's really a time to educate and to, to give enthusiasm to the other players, the younger players. Bands like um, Clon McCash or White Water, Listening Mulligan or Gagan Memorial, they would be seen at Scarva. They would not be seen at competitions. They would be there that day. Those bands come from their communities. Lots of bands historically have been family bands, community bands, maybe in the summer farmers coming in off the fields having done the hay. They would meet in the little community hall or orange hall. The sound wouldn't be comparable to what you may hear at a competition, but those guys, that's their sign. To them, that's their big day out, and that again is part of the tradition. A lot of my friends, if you're not involved in the pipe bands, they think whenever I'd be talking about where I'm at, 
you know, think well, she's crazy what she's doing. They don't actually understand you know, the enjoyment that we get out of it and how much dedication that it takes to be in the band. Made your timing there. You must keep this timing exactly the same as you start off. To learn the pipes, um, you start off in the practice chapter and you have to learn different exercises. Well, my mind, these fingers keep them straight. No wee crow's foots. My right, cherry. The young pipers, when they come in, before they even see a set of bagpipes, they must be proficient on this practice chanter. It is the starting point of all pipe banding, of all competition work. It's the starting point for the senior pipers. Right arm, you play it. Yeah, Whenever again. you want to learn a tune, you learn it on that practice chanter. They maybe spend months on it. And from then, they progress to the bagpipes. Now that is a big sea change for those kids. That is the big step. To get your coordination right, you would have to keep your blowing constant and, you know, holding your arm tight in the bag and using your arm to squeeze and then playing as well. It's hard to get it coordinated in your head to do everything at the same time. The amount of effort that goes in in band halls right around the country. Any night, there will be hundreds of pipers out and about in little band halls, totally away from the limelight. 52 weeks in the year, most pipe bands are in that band hall. You're fine tuning your competition work, you're choosing tunes to play for the next year, you're playing melody selections, you're playing marches, struss bays, reels, hornpipes, jigs, slow airs. It is your life. I'm a student at Queen's. I'm studying geography. And I do still try and make the band practice two nights in the week. Two. You have to be practicing at home as well. You know, it's no good just to go into band practice and then putting your pipes away and, you know, not seeing them to the next practice night. From about late September time till about Christmas time, we're just working, you know, round the tables on our practice chanters. The pipers and the drummers would work on their own, you know, they wouldn't be brought together yet. I would try to practice myself just at home every night. It's just not good enough here. Practice, 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 and more practice. It isn't easy to get. You've got to practice. When you produce a good sound in the band, it then enhances the playing and everybody wants to play better and do play better and it has a spiral upwards into a better overall sound of the band. In our band, everyone has a link with the past. There's a generation has come down through, there's a generation to come. Four times a year, maybe you're off to Scotland. The travel involved, the financial commitment, it's an organisation where we pay to play, and you do it only because you enjoy it, only because it's in your blood. Maybe 16 weeks or so in the year, pipe bands have their profile during the summer months, but those pipe bands are made or broken during the winter months. There are a number of competitions during the year. Port Brush is an example. It's a particular favourite competition. <laughs> Two hours possibly you would make before a competition. Probably three quarters of that time is simply tuning that instrument. When you get a team of people together playing pipes, you have somebody who has had a late night, there's somebody who has had maybe one drink too many, and on the day, you have to put them people together and make it happen. 
you've got a, a day where you've got cloud and sun, the sound of the pitch will change dramatically when the sun's out as opposed to when the clouds are there. So if, for example, if your band is doing a final tune to go into the competition and the sun just happens to come out, it can just totally ruin all the tuning that you've just done for the previous hour or, or whatever. For a stranger watching it, if you wonder why are these people looking at the clouds and why, why are they keeping on changing and tuning all the time? But the pipe major is literally having palpitations at that stage. He's being measured by how good the band is when it hits the line to play in the arena. Occasionally bands talk about going over the top. They have their sound absolutely at the peak of perfection. Maybe 10 minutes before they go on, they decide, well, will they play another tune and maybe make the chanters too sharp? Or will they not play and risk one or two of the chanters going off? That's a lot around competition work. When you're pipe major of a band um, at any level, uh, and you're going in the competition, you do have to be ruthless. You have to take tough decisions on the day. People may have practiced for months, they may have traveled a long way to be at the competition, but if things aren't right on the day for their instrument, then I have to ask that player to stand down. You have to just have that ruthless streak to say, I'm sorry, um, it's, you'll not be playing today. Dressed in Banbridge Pipe Band in the Wallace Tartan, red, yellow, and black, which are the colours in Banbridge of the rugby team, the football team, the hockey team. We represent Banbridge when we go out. The uniform, I think, bonds you together, and the whole band, they're wearing the same uniform, you know, so it's, you feel as if you're part of the whole group, and you're like a whole family. I consider myself a bandsman and a bandsman is someone who will play in a band and who is of a certain ability but he feeds off the others around him. As a band you are a unit, you are not a soloist, you are there and it's all for one and one for all. The pipe band tradition is all about the team, the unit. It's not about one person, it's about the whole band achieving a sound, a performance, in order to try and uh, win the competition on that day. When you have the pipers and drummers, you might be talking about 25 bandsmen and bandswomen, and you share the elation when you win a competition, but also the downside, it's combined woe when you lose. My best friends are involved in all the pipe bands. You know, they're like just like another family to me. What a coke. <laughs> 25 bad coke. <laughs> One generation has to carry the band forward till the next generation takes over. That's basically what happens with all bands, all pipe bands anyhow. It's a bit like a football team. They play for each other, and that's a good pipe band when they play for each other. <laughs> <laughs>